reason I'm rushing us faster is because we have to cover local search today because that is the assignment. So we have to actually go through this and then go through local search before I'm going to leave you tonight. So let's, let's get our act together. Um, informed search, and so you, we all understand the point. The point is that now we need some intuition as to where the goal is. And of course we all know intuition is good or bad depending upon whether you are an intuitive person or not an intuitive person. For example, I'm not an intuitive person, so you know, my intuition is not very good, but some of you may be. So, <coughs> so we need to talk about gut feeling, intuition, or you know, these are obviously jokes. Um, but here's the high level philosophical point. And this joke is on the traveling salesman. That if you start to analyze the problem theoretically, um, we are going to get into expansion. There's not much we can do about it. So if you want to work in practice, we have to come up with tricks of the trade. Like, right? you know, instead of traveling throughout the world, uh, it's better to just sell it on eBay. So uh, we have to come up with tricks of the trade, and one of the tricks of the trade that we are going to start with is heuristic function. The idea being that we have to smart, uh, we have to be smart about the paths that we are going to try, and not just try in all directions. So I think the difference is very clear. What, how we formally specify it is by saying that a node is selected for expansion based on an evaluation function that estimates the cost to the goal. Right. So if my goal is there, then I start walking like this. Because I can see that the goal is in this direction. The right path may be through here, actually. But the point is that I'm going to be using the information of where my goal is and which direction the goal is in order to make progress in my search. Now, this is just the formalization of what we have been doing so far. So actually, what we have learned already, which you, do, you may not realize, is a general tree, tree search and a general graph search paradigm. So the general tree search paradigm Think breakfast search in your mind is that I have a root node and I have a frontier or a fringe. Same, same meaning, uh, same word. And I'm going to remove a node from the fringe and I'm going to expand it. And so I'm going to remove it. If it's the goal, I'm done. Otherwise, I'm going to expand it and all the successes go in my frontier or in my fringe. Okay? And this is a tree search paradigm. The graph search paradigm says, I'm going to expand it, and I'm also going to keep it in, in an explored list. Some kind of list that I'm going to keep, or, or you may call it closed list, explored list, where that will help me in duplicate detection. And again, if I keep the whole of the duplicate list, then it may become really huge, but that's uh, what life is. Right? So this is the graph search paradigm. I'm making sure that I'm only going to uh, input the edges, add the edges to the fringe, if they are not in explosion. Okay. <coughs> now, the generalization of what we have been discussing and leading us to heuristic search is a model called best first search. It's a very general model. It says that I'm going to either do tree search or graph search, but at every point, I'm going to pick a node with the lowest F value. So every node has a, has a evaluation function. And I'm going to pick a node with the lowest f value and expand it. So if I were doing breadth first search, what is my f value? The depth of, this, of the node. The depth of the node. So if I have some nodes of depth 2 and some nodes of depth 3, which one am I going to pick up? one of the depth two because I have to first complete the expansion of that. Okay. If it's a uniform cost search, what is my f function? The sum of the edge costs up to this point. You had a question. So what's the difference between tree search and graph search? It's just the repeated <coughs> All right, so essentially what we have learned already is that there is a general notion of best first search. Red first search is a kind of best first search. Red, uh, uniform first search is a kind of best first search.
and uh, the uh, the map that uh, the the problem that we are going to use today for this particular part of the set of slides is that I want to go from Elard to I think <laughs> Bucharest, and this is the map of Romania. So all the people who are from Romania in this class have a very good advantage. They're going to learn heuristic size better than anybody else. Okay. <coughs> So the first algorithm is called greedy best first search. Now up until now we were saying that I'm going to weigh everything starting from the distance from the initial state. So the distance from the initial state is what is my uniform cost thing and that I'm going to expand. The complete analog of that is distance to the goal. But we don't know distance to the goal. That is a problem. Because we do not know distance to the goal, we will assume an additional input, which is called the heuristic function. And the heuristic function says, I don't know the distance to the goal, but I'm going to guess it. Gut feeling, intuition, all of those words. I'm going to guess the distance to the goal, and let's call it h. h, for heuristic. Okay. So, the complete analog of uniform cost search will be, that I'm going to pick a node which looks closest to the goal. Looks in terms of the heuristic function. So which has minimum h value. So therefore my f value, which is the evaluation function that I have just defined, is equal to h. And that is called greedy best first search. Can you think of an intuitive heuristic function for this map? Suppose my goal is Bucharest. Goal is Bucharest, right? Uh, yeah. Goal is Bucharest. So can can we have an intuitive uh, feeling of you know what is the heuristic function for let's say Niamh? Straight line to Straight line distance. It's a guess. It is it is quite possible that straight line distance may turn out to be a really bad guess, but it's a decent guess. It's not that bad. Intuitively, that's how we do it. Space needle looks there. Let me walk in this direction. Oh, I can't drive in this direction. Okay, I'll go this. I go there because I'm looking at the space needle. That's how I get the space needle all the time. <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> I used to get to uh, space needle all the time. That's how I used to. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so in this case, you can guess heuristic function because you're looking at a map. You can just have the broader picture. How many problems? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, if you cannot do it, you can't use this. Like, like you said many times you just have a something that's giving you a successor state. Like you're, you're, you know, you're just querying some state machine. So here's the deal. What I described to you in the previous part of the lecture, yeah. the atomic agent, is an abstraction. Right. Tell me one instance where that is reality. When will you ever only have a black box for your problem? You have a tough problem to solve. And the only thing you have is this black box which spits out the successors. Does it ever happen in practice? No. We have much more knowledge about the domain. If you are in a real setting. You know, it's a good abstraction to start from because if you can't even do that, then you know going deeper into the thing would be harder. It's a good starting point, but now we are going deeper, slightly, just a slight, slight depth. Okay? The depth is that I know a little bit more about the problem, and I have encapsulated that in this heuristic function. Now my that black box is also spitting me a heuristic function. Where does that heuristic function come from? Well, somebody looks at the problem and thinks about it. If it's a map, it's a straight line distance. It may be Manhattan distance if it's Manhattan, or you know some version of that. If it's another problem, it's something else. And we'll talk about heuristic functions as to how to get to that. There is an abstraction there also. But right now we have encapsulated all of that information into this heuristic function, which my black box is spinning. That's my level of information. Okay, so uh, let's quickly do greedy best first search starting from Niam. Which node will I expand? <coughs> from Lassi, which node will I expand? Okay, uh, good. So suppose I want to go from Niam to Oladia. This is my goal. 
So from the end, which node will I expand? There's only one node to expand. From lastly, which node will I expand? If I'm doing pre search, which node will I expand? Yeah. And we will keep also. So that's the first problem. If I'm only doing tree search, I'm going to re expand the same node over and over and over. So it's not necessarily complete. It's not really a tree. No, no. Tree search is a paradigm. Tree search is this algorithm. It says that, you know, just expand and put it in the tree. So I need to do duplicate detection in order to make really best first search work. Even then, it is not optimal. Okay. And unfortunately, now the time complexity and all of those notions I'm going to throw out of the window. Because what's going to happen is that really think about this. What's happening? This is like a breadth first search, right? I'm expanding and keeping the frontier and you know all of that. It's always going to be exponential. So the magic will come in the heuristic function. If I am given a very good heuristic function, then even the worst case can be exponential, because of the good heuristic function, I will expand much fewer. Numbers. And that is the game that I am going to play. So in terms of theoretical properties, we are not going to be able to do much. All the magic goes in the heuristic function. And we will show some numbers. So bad time complexity in terms of complexity, bad space complexity, in fact, it's not even b to the g, it's b to the m. Because if my heuristic function is lousy, it may take me to completely wrong side of the tree and I may be searching something completely ridiculous. So if heuristic function is messing me up, then I'm completely messed up. So um, bottom line, we'll not worry about time, space, these are all exponentials. We'll worry about com completeness and optimality. So it, it may get stuck in loops. If we are doing graph version, then it, it's complete, but it's still not optimal. Okay. So that's the greedy best first search. It says, I look at the price and I just blindly try to get to that price without any other uh, thought. The better algorithm is called A star search. And I, I'm guessing pretty much all of you know A star search. But hopefully we'll learn it in this context now. So the idea of A star search is that I should avoid expanding the parts that are already very expensive. So, yes, the goal looks closer, but maybe there's another path from here, from another place which is faster, because I've already spent too much getting to this point. And that is the intuition that is missing. So, intuitively, uniform cost for search starts from initial state, slowly increases the, increases my horizon. Greedy best first search tries to get to the goal, trying to get to the point which look closer to the goal. And a better mix would be where I am somehow capturing the cost that I have had to pay up until now and also incorporating the cost that I may have to pay later in life to get to the goal. And do my evaluation function that is a mix of the two. And that evaluation function is g plus h. So g is the cost so far, uh, like uniform cost search, and h is the estimated cost of it. And that's what A star search. That's it. There's nothing more to it, really. You know, understand A star search. But let's, for completeness, do this. So Allard. Allard says, uh, this is my initial state, so f is equal to g plus h, so g is 0, cost from initial state is 0, and this is my straight line distance, that is the heuristics, 360 is 6, so that is my f function. I expand it, these are the nodes that look like, uh, that I get, uh, the h cost here is 140, so this is 140, the h cost here is 118, so this is 118, this is the expected cost to reach the goal, and so this is my new f function. So which node am I going to pick for expansion? Because this is the lowest f So I expand this. Now, which node am I going to pick? So you what? Fagaras. <laughs> Fagaras, because it is 415. No. This is 430. I'm going to expand this. And now I might expand that. 
and now I might expand this and at some point I reach beta rest and so I got my power. Okay, so this is how A star search works. So we need to compare frontiers. It's not just a child node. No, no, all frontiers, always, always. And how does calculate the second part, like 329? 329. That is the heuristic function that is given to me by this platform. That's the input. That's why it's called informed search. Now I'm using some more domain knowledge. I have more information about the domain than I had before. Now, the first question that you should ask is whether this is optimal. I found a path, but is it any good? Is it the best path, for example? Yeah. Yes. And <laughs> you all know your stress size, so you can quickly rush through this. So, the most important notion that you will learn in this part of the lecture is the notion of admissible heuristics. And you may already know about this. A heuristic is admissible if it is an optimistic estimate of reaching the goal. Forget what is written here. Then. The word is optimism. If I want optimality, I have to be optimistic in life. It's a weird. So, uh, so optimism, right? So if I want to minimize my distance to the goal, what is the most optimistic estimate? Zero. Zero. I am the goal. <laughs> so that is the most uninformative admissible heuristic. And the more informative the heuristic is, the closer it is to the real value, the real answer, the truth. But as long as it is admiss admissible, it is always a lower bound. If I want to maximize my distance to the goal, maximize my uh, uh, prize money, then an admissible heuristic would be an upper bound. So therefore, you will get confused whether admissible heuristic should be lower bound or upper bound. Don't think in those terms. Think it should be optimistic. So whatever the true value is, it is going to be more optimistic than that. So if it is minimization, it's going to be underestimating. If it is maximization, it's going to be overestimating. And now there are two theorems that I'm not going to give proofs of. But for the theoretically inclined, please read the book. Uh, it's very, they are very easy theorems, really. Uh, so if I'm using tree search, that means no duplicate detection, I'm actually expanding nodes over and over. Then by using admissible heuristic, A star is optimal. Which means once A star finds a path to the goal, that will be the least cost path. And it is very easy to see why that will be, because it is expanding paths in the order of increasing F value f is equal to g plus h. So at any point, if I found a path, h is equal to 0 for the goal. So I got exact f value of the path to the goal. All the other nodes have only higher f values. And because h is admissible, which is a lower bound, the actual solution cost through these other nodes is going to be even higher than the current f values and therefore my current path is optimal. Again, if this happened too fast, read the book, it's not very good. So that is the argument. On the other hand, if I am doing the better, the more intelligent version of the algorithm, which is the duplicate detection version, then I need slightly stronger property called consistency. And consistency says that H has to follow the triangular inequality. And so the theorem says that if I'm using graph search, then HN has to be a consistent heuristic. Which means that there are two nodes, N and N prime, and one is estimating the cost of the goal as H of N, one is estimating cost of the goal as H of N prime, and this is the cost of going from N to N prime, then H of N has to be less than or equal to this plus this. That's the consistency property. And you can prove that if, it's, if a heuristic is consistent, then it is definitely admissible. So consistency is a stronger problem. Okay. Again, I'm just giving you the high level ideas here. It's, it's, you can. So, give me a, a minute. 
it is complete it is exponential it is exponential and it is optimal depending upon the right algorithm and the right heuristic the only catch here is that we are expanding nodes in the order of increasing f so if there are infinite nodes in the graph and there are infinite nodes which have their f value less than the f value of the goal which is possible technically speaking then this would not be complete so again there is a small catch but more or less in practice we would think of it as a complete algorithm yes if the heuristic is consistent yes it's admissible yes what's the example of it's admissible but not consistent okay i'll give you that that as an assignment tonight figure it out not very hard you can construct this small one so let's if you remember your um if you remember your the um, animations that we did last time on uniform cost search and oh come on um drag for search and uniform cost search it took forever right we were really you know we hated the fact that you know it couldn't reach the goal so this is how a star works and notice this whole yellow part has the same f value and that is why and then it is making sure that all the other possible branches it has to first prove that they are suboptimal before it can get to the goal Uh, I think it's uh, either Manhattan or straight line distance. I forget. As soon as you know this this happens, it pretty much makes it completely impossible. But notice that this is so much less painful. Then depth first search or breadth first search with that we saw last time. Yeah. Big problem. So, and then if we uh, if we did greedy best first search, that will be even more interesting. It will basically go zoop in that direction really quickly. but then there may be some situations where that particular one will get completely messed up because say there it's blocked here then that one will take a long time to recover so if you can be myopic and in the, the the domain is good for you actually greedy best for such in practice can be even much better even better even faster not optimal faster but a star has this right balance that it is optimal and it expands much less uh, memory or time in general But it depends on the quality of the heuristic, obviously. Yes. So, given the certain kinds of situations, different algorithms can really excel. Is it generally we're trying to view things in parallel? Then, or? see, we are talking about NP hard or worse problems. Why not? Always. So, you cannot have a free line, which means you cannot have a single algorithm that just works all the time. It will never happen. So yes, you look at the problem, you try various ideas, you find more structure in the problem, you add, you start with a star algorithm, but say, hmm, a star is missing this intuition which is so specific for my domain. Let me add that intuition or that knowledge in my search. So yes, there are two kinds of things happening. People in the search community who do research in search community, they keep coming up with newer and newer algorithms, and their hope is that in the in the long run they will find this one killer algorithm that you know does everything. That's great. You know, they should keep working at it. And people who work on the application side start from you know a fairly understood algorithm like they start, and then they will add a little bit more knowledge based on their understanding of the domain, and you know try to make the search faster. Okay. So this is. This is breadth first search. This is uniform cost search, and now this is A star. 
So notice that there is a bit of goal directedness happening, which is the whole point of what we were trying to do with you. If it, if it was not happening, then something would have been wrong. This is an interesting uh, part that I think you will appreciate. So, okay, what is the best possible heuristic? Best possible admissible heuristic, yes. Exact cost. It's an estimate of the cost to the goal. So what is the best possible heuristic? Which knows the cost to the goal, right? How much time will we take to compute it? Forever, right? Because it's solving the original problem. But the worst possible heuristic? Zero. Will it help anything? Nothing. It will become red first search. The algorithm will become more uniform first search. So now, there are two competing things happening. There is a cost of search given the heuristic. And then there is cost of computing the heuristic. How much time does it take to compute the worst heuristic possible? No time. So zero. Constant time. So, so this is the cost of searching with the heuristic. If I really know the optimal value, the h star, then the search time may be really, really low. But the cost of computing the heuristic may be really, really high. And you know, vice versa. So, bottom line is that what we are looking for intuitively is the heuristic which minimizes the sum of time taken to compute it plus the time taken to search with it. So, we are looking for this point. Of course, if we knew what this point is, then you know it will not be an NP hard problem or worse. So, we don't know this point, but that's the exercise that we are looking for this heuristic which doesn't take too much time to compute and is informative enough for me to reduce my search. How do you compute the I mean, it depends on the domain. Old wisdom was this minimum is somewhere here. But that wisdom is being questioned, and we are going to talk about them uh, now. Uh, for example, in pattern database heuristics. How many of you know have heard the term pattern database? Have you heard about it before then? Oh, okay. Yeah. Good. So, but let's just see if there's anything else in the middle. Oh yeah, iterative deepening is done. So iterative deepening is done. So we know iterative deepening breadth first search, sorry, depth first search. What would be the equivalent version of iterative deepening A star? We avoid the memory problem by doing F limited search. So we are searching in increasing F. So we will say that my F bound is some F, star, uh, F bound. And I'm going to do depth first search up until that F bound. If I don't find the goal, then I increase my f bound. It's called iterative deepening a star. Similar properties, better algorithm than a star. In fact, is how do I increase my f bound? Then I keep track of the searches that I am preempting and just look for what will be the next good f bound based on the notes that I have seen so far. So I might cover too fast, but I think the intuition is perfectly clear. Any questions on that? There is another algorithm that I had slides for, that's called depth first branch and bound. But I'm going to do that next time in another context. So we'll come to that algorithm uh, in the next class. So now there are many non-optimal versions. So A star is optimal, IDA star is optimal. We also have many non-optimal versions. And if I have to pick one non-optimal version for you to learn, this would be that. It's called weighted A star. And the idea is the following. See, f is equal to g plus h. So right now we are saying that we give equal weight to you know the cost to this point and the cost power. And that's the right number because this is what we are optimizing also. But we also know that if we do greedy best first search, then we can quickly <coughs> zoom towards the goal. And that often works. So what if we give h some higher weight. And if we give some higher weight, 
then we can call it weighted a star f is equal to g plus w times h n, where w is usually uh, obviously greater than one. And uh, you can actually prove a couple of things. So you can prove that this is complete. So you will actually get to the solution. So it will not be as bad as really best for search in the worst cases. Moreover, the solution that you find, the it will not be optimal, but it will have a suboptimality bound, which is bounded by W. So if you keep W to be 5, then you will get the path of the uh, solution, which is within 5 times the optimal. Again, these things are rather easy to prove. Because now you are expanding everything in this, in, in the order of increasing f again. So, you know, whatever solution you find will have the same properties. Yeah. So, what's the interval between the intuition for using a sum, not a polynomial or a sum of? Because that is, if you want to optimize the total cost the goal, right? So the total cost is the sum of the cost up to this point and the cost forward. So that's part of the intuition. If we just generate a random g times h raised to the power 5, there will be no intuition or no logic of that. You can do whatever you want to do, but that there will be no logic of that. Yeah, you can do whatever you want to do. You can create your own algorithms, but I don't think you will be able to say anything very really formal about it. Alright. So coming back to the most important part of this this uh, lecture, which I said was admissible history. So notion of admissibility. So we're going to put our energies together and get an intuition of what does it mean to have an admissible heuristic for a domain. Okay. And a lot of you have been asking me this question: Where does this heuristic come from? How do we compute it? Whether it is really given to us? Who gives it, a, it to us? And so on. So what I'm going to do next, and I think this is the most important part of this lecture, this part of the lecture, is how do we think about computing an admissible heuristic? Of course, it will still be domain dependent, but is there an abstraction or is there a general notion or general idea of how to compute it? And, and the key word, the buzzword here would be relaxation. So, I am looking for a heuristic that estimates the distance from this to this and is a lower bound. It underestimates this distance. Okay, do you have any suggestions? Just looking at this particular problem. And How many tiles need to be moved? How many tiles need to be moved? How many? How oh, far are they? Well, yeah, yeah, one, one at a time. So, Do you see that that is at least the number of moves that I will have to make? What is the answer? How many times do I have to move? Do I have to move 7? Yes. yes, 2, yes, 4, yes, 5, yes, 6, 8, okay. In this case, I have to move all the times. So I will have to move all these 8 times at least once in order to go from here to here, right? Can somebody think of a slightly better heuristic? So the thing is like when you move. Wait, 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 one at time, one at time, one at time. Sum of how Okay, this Manoj, right? Yeah. Yes. The sum of the distance of the starting and the final point. The sum of the distances, what does the distance so mean? The sum of the distance of the path to which at least thinking that I can move a straight line. So distance so like the straight line distance? No, no. The Manhattan yeah. distance? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So sum of the Manhattan distances from the beginning position to the end position for each time. Divided by two. Divided by two? Because one move is going to move two tiles. Is one move going to move two tiles? It's one move could move two tiles. For example, which move? Depends on what you define as a move. Think about, think about a puzzle. How can you move two tiles together? Well, when you play on the computer and you click and the and the <laughs> space at the top, you click the bottom and both tiles move up. Nice. I mean, okay. No. 
So I haven't played that version of the game, but this is a, like a really normal, simple, physical version that we are playing. So it moves the gap, but we are not counting the gap, so let's not worry about the gap. So at one move can only move one time. So first of all, do you both, do you understand the two hill streams that we have discussed? Let's call them H1 and H2. How many of you believe that, okay, how many of you feel that H1 is an admissible hill stream? How many of you feel that it is not an admissible hill stream? So pretty much everybody feels that it's an underestimate. It is a lower bound on the, the cost. What about H2? Does anybody feel that H2 is not an admissible hill stream? Yes. By moving, say moving one tile to a specific spot, you could inadvertently move other tiles into the correct spot? Yeah. Or I guess that would count, that would be the same. Because they're not double bounding. So uh, we are only saying that two needs at least one move, or uh, seven needs at least one, two, three moves to get to this point. So it does need at least seven explicitly will have to make at least three moves to get to this point, or maybe more. We're never moving to pieces. So therefore, both of these are admissible histories, right? Now, the question is, is there an abstraction here? You know, you, you saw this problem, and you just intuitively come, came up with these, you know, heuristics. It was not really very tough. And rest assured, I'm definitely going to give you some problem someday, either in the exam or in an assignment. But you're given a new problem, and you have to come up with a new heuristic. So the question is, what do we have to think in order to come up with an admissible heuristic? And the claim that I'm going to make is that I have to relax the problem, which means I have to remove some of the constraints of the problem. What what am I what am I uh, what constraint am I relaxing in order to get to H1F of S? Yes. The number of moves. It's basically saying you can move straight to the position. Yes. What's the name? You can fly. That is the constraint I'm relaxing. Earlier I could only go into the gap, now I can actually fly and land directly to wherever I want, want, want to land. And moreover, I am allowed to put two pieces on the same same square, same position. Is this a relaxation of the original problem? Is there anything? That's an important point that I could do in the original problem that I cannot do in this new problem? So what I have done is that whatever was allowed before is now still allowed. And even more that was not allowed before is now allowed. And that is a relaxation. I have relaxed some constraints of the problem without introducing any new constraints. Whenever I have that, the heuristic that I'm going to generate from the optimal solution to this new problem is guaranteed to be at this. For obvious reasons, you are going to make less moves because now you can do more moves. What is the relaxation for H2? You can move on top of the tiles. What's your name? Uh -huh. okay. That's it. That's our abstraction. So if you have to take one take home message from this section of the lecture, this is it. This is the slide that you need to remember. You knew your strategy. Okay. There's a notion of dominance. The notion of dominance says that a heuristic is better than other heuristic if uh, it is more informative. And the more informative the heuristic is, it reduces uh, the search depth, the search nodes. For example, for 12 puzzle, 12 puzzle would be probably 4 cross 3 puzzle, iterative deepening search will take about 3 million nodes. 
A star search with just a silly H1 heuristic is going to take only 227 nodes. And A star search with 73 uh, with the better H2 heuristic is going to take 73 nodes. For 24 puzzle, ideas will never be able to finish. Something doesn't look right. This is not 24 puzzle. This is depth 24. I'm sorry. For 8 puzzle, depth 24. The, the solution stay, uh, lies at depth 24. Because 24 puzzle is actually a very hard problem, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So, uh, ideas will never be able to finish this. A star with H1 heuristic can solve it in 39,000 nodes. A star with H2 heuristic can solve it in 1,000 nodes. So, bottom line, A star changes the game. It puts in some intelligence in the heuristic function, but with that heuristic function, we are able to search much better than what we could search on our own using uninformed search. We have already discussed the notion of relaxation. This is what happens with A star. Eight puzzle can all can be solved in brute force search. Okay. Rubik's cube can also be solved with brute force search. I didn't know that. Interesting. Fifteen puzzle can be solved with brute force search in six days. Twenty-four puzzle can be solved with brute force search also. Not in our lifetime. Most likely, none of us, mankind will not be around. What are we supposed to do? Now, <coughs> here's some other anecdotal uh, information. IDA star, which is the better algorithm, could solve with just Manhattan distance, the H2 heuristic, for 15 puzzle. And the optimal solution was about 53 moves, so D was 53. About 400 million nodes were generated on average. It took about 50 seconds, or it will take about 50 seconds on current machine. So 15 puzzle is rather an easy problem. What line is, IDA star, 15 puzzle, don't worry about it. However, when we move, move one step further, so we're talking about now five class five puzzle, so 24 puzzle, IDA star with the H2 heuristic is going to take about 65,000 years. So this is IDA star. So better algorithm, uh, it is going to take about 65,000 years. So clearly, if we wanted to solve 25 puzzle, 24 puzzle, then we have to think more. So let's try to think more. So suppose this is the only thing that is given to you, that uh, this is my gap. Um, Let's not worry about gap. Let's just think about this. So 3, 1, 1, 3. This is my ending configuration. Now H1 is going to say 2, right? Yeah, 2 plus water. H2 is going to say 1, 2, 3, 4. What will you say? Maybe have four or a minimum of four. Minimum of four? Mm -hmm. Three. 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 At least eight. At least eight? Yeah. Are you sure? Somebody is miscounting. I think you got the idea, but you are miscounting. Two to the Manhattan. Two to the Manhattan. Why? You will do one, two, three, four, five. So just to go around, you have to add 2. That's called the linear conflict heuristic. So now what we are doing? We are looking at the problem and saying, OK, we have to think more deeply about how to generate a fast, good heuristic better than the Manhattan distance. So we can play that game and say Manhattan distance is 4 moves, but there's a linear conflict. In order to surpass the linear conflict, I will have to add 2. So I'm going to add 2, and so the linear conflict heuristic will make it 6. Why is it 2? I don't know. Just so 1, yeah. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So you have to go down and up. 
want to go off to. So with linear conflict heuristic, we reduced the uh, total number of nodes, but it still didn't get us to be able to solve 24 puzzles. So some of you may be thinking, why are we discussing this? Do we really want to solve 24 puzzles in our AI class? But that's the point. You will have some problem at hand, and you will come up with some heuristic, and you will work on it, and you know sometimes it will work, and you are done. But if it is not fast enough, or it is, if it is taking too much time, you actually have to do some domain analysis to think about what's the better heuristic. So you have to come up with insights for that domain. So we're going to discussing it for 24 puzzles. But now it's getting us to a more general notion called pattern databases. Now, uh, suppose I divide my problem and say, I want to get all of these seven pieces at the right spots. I don't worry about the whites. So all the whites are the same. Okay. Solve this problem optimally. So this is a smaller problem than the original 15 puzzle problem. So hopefully we will be able to solve it in some time. Do you agree that the solution, the number of moves that I took, will be an admissible heuristic to the original problem? So, so the question is the following. Suppose I ask you to solve this problem, where I don't care for the whites, but they have to be moved in order to get to the right place. And you solve this problem optimally. And you counted the number of moves it takes to go from this configuration to this configuration. Will this number of moves be an admissible heuristic? Yes. Yes. So, And it's also a much more informed heuristic because I'm actually solving a sub-problem deeply. What does MD stand for? Manhattan distance. Oh. So this just shows you that this heuristic is much more informed than Manhattan distance heuristic. I'm of course doing much more work in solving this. So there is a patent database heuristic which says that I'm going to solve all these possible sub-problems. How many sub problems may I have? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of the distinguished blocks and a gap and other undistinguished blocks. So basically, lots of problems. 16, 8 factorial, 16, 2, something, whatever. Basically, lots of these problems. So I solved all of those problems ahead of time. Now, this would be a really large database. So I have to keep it as a database. And I'm going to call it pattern database. So for example, seven tile pattern database. This is a seven tile, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Pattern database for 15 puzzles contains 519 million entries. So I pre-compute these 519 million entries. It's going to take me a long time to do this, actually. But less than 65,000 years. Now, given a new problem like this, what do I do? I invoke the pattern database heuristic and ask for the value. And I get some value, say 31, and that gives me an admissible heuristic. In fact, I can combine multiple pattern databases. For example, I divided my problem into the red nodes and the blue nodes. And I first solve for the red part of it, and then solve for the blue part of it. So I have two pattern databases, one with seven tile interactions, one with eight tile interactions. This is the seven tile, this is the eight tile. And let us suppose that 31 moves are needed to solve the red tiles, 22 moves are needed to solve the blue tiles. Then can you come up with an admissible heuristic based on this information? OK, so that's an actually interesting point. How many of you think that the red plus blue is an admissible heuristic? Yeah. How many of you think that max of red and blue is an admissible heuristic? Why do they have to own one or the other? I'm not saying it has to be one or the other. You can raise hands both the time. 
<laughs> How many of you feel that max of two admissible heuristics is an admissible heuristic? So people are not raising the hand. Does anybody have a counter argument? Or you are you're just not thinking too much? If H1 is less than H star and H2 is less than H star, then max of H1, H2 is also? So max of two admissible heuristics is always admissible. So one thing is very clear that I have two admissible heuristics, 31 and 22, then 31 is definitely admissible and also 22. But it's less informative, so we must not worry about it. The question is, is 53 admissible? How many of you feel that 53 is admissible in this particular case? Okay, so you have an explanation. Yeah. What's the name? Marius. Well, um, it was uh, each of uh, them relaxes the original problem. The red one um, thinks there's no blue ones, and the solving the blue ones is made. Is no, 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 no. So, the, the good point. The way we defined our problem was that the red one knows that there are some other tiles, but they are indistinguishable. Yeah, they are not gaps. So, in the process of moving the whites, we may also be helping the blues. In fact, we can be solving the blues. We may even be solving the blues in that way. Right? So, if we are counting the whites, then we have to take the max or sum. If, however, we say that I am only going to count the number of moves that I make on the red tiles, I may move whites, but I am not going to count them, then can I take the sum? Yes. What do you mean by when you say you are not going to count whites? Which means that you know, if I, in order to get here, I, I come here, move the white, and not count the white in the solution. I have an optimal solution. I only count the red moves. So in this case, yes. in this case, if we uh, were a little bit over, so it was inadmissible, but just by a small amount, can we run the same solution ten times and perhaps get better performance? Because we know what the op what the end goal is. So maybe right. Run the so so to the end goal. so it is very common to run A star with inadmissible heuristics. Very common. Why? Because the guarantee of admissibility often makes the heuristic less informative. And if optimality is not what we really care for, then it's better to actually use an inadmissible heuristic. Give me one minute. I want to make this, this is an important point which did not come out so far. So admissible heuristic is important for guaranteeing optimality. If we do not have, need optimality, then it may be better to use an inadmissible heuristic. I think this is an important point that we should. However, by running the same algorithm over and over again, we are not going to get optimal uh, 1 out of 10 times because it's a deterministic algorithm. There's no probabilistic part. Somebody else had a question. Sorry. So I think we are done here. So in this particular case, we need to take the max. However, there is something called additive pattern databases where we separate the tiles and not double count them, in which case uh, if one needs 20 moves, other needs 25 moves, then we can add them. And I think now with the additive pattern databases, we can solve the 25 or the 15 puzzle in less than 29 milliseconds which is you know, 1,700 times faster than Manhattan distance, and I think we can also solve the 25 puzzle, though this slide doesn't say it, so I wouldn't necessarily claim. So, uh, pre-compute time is really huge. Right? Pre-compute time is really huge. That's going to be factorial in prison. Yeah. So you can divide it into multiple pattern data. So you, you divide so it. I mean, is there some if it's a larger puzzle, then divide it into five parts and solve the five parts together and you know add them. That's how eventually you will have to end up doing because you might not even be able to solve just two subparts of it because that may be a huge problem. Right? Mm -hmm. Even here, you know, for 
eight tiles, you have 58, 519 million entries in the heuristic itself. So, so I think, I mean, this, this part, this section that we just did on pattern databases is an advanced section. Usually, AI courses will not talk about it. We did it because you know, every now and then we should do something advanced, and we continue to reinforce this in every other lecture as much as possible. Um, it's an interesting point. If you end up really using AI style in practice, most likely pattern databases is going to be very helpful to you, especially if you can compute the heuristic offline. So as you just mentioned, for pattern databases, you need to compute the heuristic offline because you may be solving a lot of problems for different patterns, sub-problems. So if you can compute that offline, then when at the need of the hour when you have to do the search, you can just invoke it, get the value, and solve the problem. Yes, Alan. What does it need to database? What can you run a simplified program? What will happen is that whenever you touch a new state, you'll have to learn several pattern database equivalent problems. Yeah. Solve so those problems. Simplify so they shouldn't take very long compared to the big problem. Why not? Oh, because you're ignoring the half of the like Yeah, so it will be faster than the original yeah. problem, but it's still it may be significant. So it's a question of how much time does it take to you for you to compute the heuristic and uh, how much time do you have for some. It's a question of how often do you need to do this? All the time. So if you have to really do it often, it doesn't make sense. It makes sense to do it. Yeah, that's also a good point. So if you have to solve multiple problems over and over and over, then it makes sense to cache the heuristic. So that's not a good point. All of these are good points. These are basic practical issues. Okay, so now we're going to take another file, and then we'll talk about the part that is needed for your assignment. So this is your time to refresh, uh, yeah. maybe take seven.